that outdate you. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm running out of adjectives to describe Iowa's offense, Mark. <laughs> Deplorables come out of my mouth quite quite a bit. You know what? This let's be honest though. This last week against Minnesota, yes. I mean, I don't know if you watched the whole game. The offense was pretty good. It was, I mean, it was good because partly because you have a quarterback who didn't take sacks, and you had a play caller in Brian Ferentz who finally decided to do something different. And Brian said Wednesday during his media availability that after the Wisconsin game, he had felt like Iowa had lost its identity. Now there's a couple things about that. A that does not absolve you of responsibility for, you know, taking the dump in Madison. All right. That does not absolve you from responsibility there because that's exactly what happened. That loss was on Kirk and on Brian, right? I don't think you put it on anybody else, but those two guys. Ultimately, the responsibility lies there. But the other thing that doesn't do, or the other thing that tweet or that comment, it wasn't a tweet, it was a comment from Brian that uh, they had lost their identity. That's also hogwash because they never had an identity, Mark. This offense has never had an ide- identity under Brian Ferentz. If you look at the history of Iowa football under Brian or even under Kirk, the offense has never been great. There have been years where it's been decent. And honestly, that's all it needs to be. The problem and the reason why Iowa hasn't competed for more West championships is because there haven't been enough years where it's been decent. And that should be very depressing to Iowa fans because, you know, it's sort of like Iowa basketball. We just got done talking with Coach Gary Close over it from the Hawkeye of the Storm channel talking about Iowa basketball. Of course, we're early there and we're playing a lot of uh, mid-majors and, and lower level teams that we're not really able to get a good gauge on Iowa yet. Um, but it's sort of with Iowa basketball, same thing where Iowa for years under Fran McCaffrey, especially these last few years, Iowa just needed to be decent on defense and they can't achieve it. Like year in and year after they're, they're so bad defensively that they're wasting elite historic offenses because they have a crappy defense and it's the exact opposite in football where their defenses year in and year out, Mark, are top 10 in the country and yet the offense continues to squander these opportunities so um i'll give brian credit i'm not going to sit here and just continue to bash him and not give him credit where credit's due he called a good game saturday that was a well-conceived game plan and although iowa's defense struggled to stop the run against minnesota and lost time of possession wasn't even close part of the reason time of possession wasn't close is because i was actually taking some shots so that's okay. You can win without winning time of possession. It's not one of the top few parameters, at least according to Coach Patterson. And we saw that play out on Saturday. I believe it was 41 to 19 time of possession. That's that's stark. And that happens against Minnesota, though. They always win time of possession. Yeah. Win or lose. Be, if that was a greater indicator of win-loss, that they'd be undefeated because you're right. They they Their offensive line is best in the Big Ten in my opinion, now maybe you would make a case that Ohio State's is better. Not according to Pro Football Focus and me. No, just well, Pro, Pro Football, Football Focus, Focus for sure. Pro, Pro, Pro Football Focus has them number one. Oh, that's right. They they did. <laughs> Ohio State number three. Ohio State's number three and okay. Iowa's number four. So <laughs> in other words, we're saying that Iowa's offensive line is better than Wisconsin's. Think about that for a second. That's ridiculous. But... You know, I, I give I give Brian credit for calling a very good game good game this week. And if he does the same thing Saturday, they'll beat Illinois. And if he does the same thing on Black Friday, they'll beat Nebraska. And if that happens, this team can still win the West. There's a I don't know why this is, but there, the the flame around Iowa football has sort of dimmed a little bit. Like we've had a lot of great response in our post game shows, but there's just less hype. I'm feeling mm-hmm. less hype in the state. Oh, and- I do too. I feel I less hype just taking feedback from yeah Hawkeye fans. I think it's because we're relying on Wisconsin to lose, and it feels like we we end up in this position every year, Mark. We're always like the last couple of weeks, it's like, well, we could still win the West, but Wisconsin's got to lose to somebody. And usually they don't, and that's Iowa's own fault because they lose to Wisconsin every year. Um, So, the, you know, they could potentially still win the West. Wisconsin's got to lose to either Nebraska or Minnesota which is possible. Um, 
if, if you know, the good news is Iowa is still in play for that. And um, you never know. College football is weird. Nebraska's played a lot of teams close, Mark, as you know. They've had problems closing, but who knows? Maybe they'll go up to Madison and win this weekend. Uh, thank you, Brian, for subscribing. Thank you, Circle Herc, for subscribing. Um, there was a series of statistics in the live chat, I believe, last week, if you recall. And I want to get to that in a second. In addition to circling back to get uh, closure on my two-parter about Linderbaum. Yes. So the... If you recall, I believe this was on our Iowa show last week that somebody listed the offensive ranks for the Iowa offense over the past ten years or or more. That was that was Kevin Downey because he continues to spam our channel with those rankings, <laughs> which I have no problem with. Kevin is very passionate about those rankings, Mark. And Kevin's a, an Iowa fan. I think so. Okay. I, he, I mean, if if not, he's pretty infatuated with Iowa. No, he he comment. He's a very active. We appreciate his support. He's a very active user on our channel. But yeah, he's been very vocal about how he feels about Iowa's offense. I believe you stated after reviewing those offensive ranks, and I will go on the record as saying, as I have many times, that I am not as married to offensive and defensive traditional ranks as maybe some people are. I think it's an indication. It's a barometer, but it, a yardage total doesn't tell us everything by any stretch, but it's a strong indication. And you said something to the effect that you were okay with Iowa ranking in the 60s. Is that correct? Well, that's a lot better than they have in... In the I, 60s? I, they're like in the 80s and... and 90s mark consistently oh. <laughs> what i don't know what they're at this year if someone wants to look that up for total offensive ranking but i mean 60s sounds tremendous um you know maybe i mean th th again i don't think we appreciate how good this defense is um and it created a ton of turnovers early in the season and it's not like they haven't still created turnovers i mean they had at least what two or three against northwestern a couple weeks ago um, did they have any on Saturday against uh, Minnesota? I think they did. I can't even, it feels like that game's been a month ago. But um, they're still creating turnovers, and they did struggle against the run against Minnesota, but everybody struggles against the run against Minnesota. Um, doesn't matter who they put back there at running back. Uh, they're able to run well. And um, so it will be interesting to see if Iowa can run the football against uh, against Illinois. And how Iowa's defense plays because Iowa's defense has been on the on the field a lot here recently. I mean, obviously the Minnesota game, but even going further back, the Wisconsin loss. Um, Wisconsin ran the ball well, and Iowa had problems getting off the field. In the Purdue game, same thing. Uh, that was more, of course, the passing attack. But the defense has been taking on a heavy load. The good news is they got Riley Moss back this past week, and that seemed to help. That seemed to anchor down that other corner spot. Um, Terry Roberts is, looks like he's still out, which is unfortunate. But now they've got some depth there at corner that we're comfortable with with Jamari Harris, Riley Moss, Matt Hankins. Matt Hankins has been struggling a bit. I don't know where he ranks in pro football focuses cornerbacks, but he gave up a couple plays. He had a touchdown to Ottman Bell, deep ball where he got burned and then sold out against the run, which was probably more um, a conceptual thing from Phil Parker that uh, you could probably put on the, on the staff there. Um, i trying to think of the – number 42 big white guy for Minnesota that got loose. It was a good, well, well-conceived play from PJ Fleck and Hankins caught back up to the play and nearly got it out before the guy crossed the goal line. It's name starts with a K and I can't think of what it is, but Hankins got sort of beat on that play as well. Cause he sold out against the run. So Hankins has been struggling a little bit. Um, and that's why it's, it's good timing. They got Riley Moss back and they've created a little bit of depth with Harris as well. co -keefed. Co-Keefe, there you go. Yep, and he nearly had a second touchdown um, early in the game in the first quarter if Tanner Morgan – Iowa caught a lot of breaks on Saturday, uh, Mark, and I talked with Don about this. That first quarter, there was a touchdown that, that would would have been uh, – ended up being for not. Um, Keefe had a catch in the back of the end zone where Morgan just threw a little bit too high. would have mm -hmm. been a touchdown. Yep. There was another throw from Morgan that was a high throw on third down in the third to Ottman Bell, which would have moved the chains and kept a drive going. Um, 
and there were a couple other plays that I'm trying to think of, but they cut, they cut some breaks. Uh, so, so we're going to finally carry it all the way through my two parter on Linderbaum. <laughs> so my first one, I believe you answered to a certain extent to say he is the player we believe him to be. And he has had a all American type season. Okay. Yeah. So, so if that's the case, what does that say about the other four guys? And what does this say about what is potentially the offensive line performance next year, unless they make some tremendous changes slash development? Yeah, I would be concerned. I mean, you got to look at Iowa from a reasonable, reasonable standpoint and realize that Iowa never runs the football well. Um, very rarely, I should say. Uh, last year they did, but I almost wanted to just throw that year out because it almost seems just like it was an outlier, um, a mirage, if you will, because of some of the issues across the conference with the, with the virus. Um, they never run the football well, so you can't have an expectation that they're going to all of a sudden run the football well and that with this scheme. But the the one the one thing that I would say in response to that comment, Mark, and this is why I have confidence that this this offensive line can end up being good. I'm not saying they're going to run the ball great, but it can be good at least in pass protection and decent on the ground is the fact that these aren't like 2019 when Iowa struggled protecting Stanley, that was because of a couple, well, two or three guys, one of which got injured, but a couple guards that were like super seniors, but couldn't block at all. And I don't really know. I don't know what happened there as far as development for, at guard that year. Again, they, they lost Cole Banwart early in that, that season, I believe. Um, but this is not, this is different this year. These are young guys, again, true freshman Richmond on the left, Nick DeYoung on the right. If they truly like those two guys, and I think they do, I mean, I'm still concerned about why are there not older guys besides Jack Plum that they can turn to at tackle. But they, they have lost Tristan Wirfs and Eric Jackson in recent years who have been anchors on that line. But if Richmond and DeYoung can develop a little bit in this offseason, being thrown into the fire early in their careers will only help. So if you got Linderbaum back, I, I at least have some confidence that tackle can take a big step forward. Center will still be good. And then the question, the fair question becomes, will Justin Britt, Cody Inns, um, Connor Colby, he's another guy. He's a true freshman who's playing. And Mason Richmond, I keep calling him a true freshman. He's a redshirt freshman. And Colby's a true freshman playing at right guard. So they're very young with the pieces that they are banking on for the future. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out the right way to, to phrase that, Mark, because there have been these apologists for Kirk and Brian that, oh, it's a young offensive line. Give them time. That narrative is bull because they've got old pieces in Cody and Britt, Linderbaum, Plum. Those guys just aren't playing well enough, minus like Linderbaum. Shots, another guy who's old. Um, but I'm, I guess what I'm saying is the hope is the young guys who have gotten a lot of playing time, those will be the guys that take a step forward. But the verdict is still out on George Barnett, Mark. I mean, he's a first-year Big Ten O-line coach. A lot of success in the MAC, but certainly uh, based on what we've seen year one, um, his performance as an offensive line coach wouldn't stand out to me from the outside looking in. What I'm not seeing in the live chat is the typical voice of college football audience. These are like, uh, this is a completely new audience to me. I don't see anyone that I recognize must be a complete split of audiences between our Iowa audience and the rest of college football. Interesting. And Andy Teeple, Mark, the most recent com comment. Um, okay. I haven't been listening to Andy, but man, Andy's really down on this offensive line. The young after this year will never see the field again. Plum might be the worst lineman to ever play for Kirk. Well, Andy, if that's the case, we got some major problems. If they're playing, if if they're playing a lineman right now at left tackle, who's the starting left tackle, by the way, and I know because Richmond went down, if, if that, if he's the worst lineman to ever play for, for Kirk, then we got some problems. People have been really down on, on DeYoung, but Richmond hadn't played well either. And shots been hurt. And again, we've made excuses for him and, and, you know, Ince has been hurt, but nobody's playing well besides 
Linderbaum. Um, these last couple of weeks, I think their issues have been shadowed a little bit, Mark, because of the fact that Padilla has, like, it's not like he's making tons of plays with his legs, but he's not taking sacks. So that's an interesting development that we're kind of maybe missing. He's not taking sacks. So there's something different. Either teams are not game planning well enough for um, the change at quarterback, uh, or it's simply the fact that even just a little bit of movement in the pocket makes that offensive line look a lot better because Petrus was a statue back there. Um, So, you know, it'll be interesting to see. Illinois is going to throw a lot at Iowa. Illinois' defense is pretty good. Can we agree on that, Mark? That's a pretty darn good defense. Yes. Um, they've stepped up to the plate, held Minnesota to six points. Um, you know, they struggled week one, or uh, not week one. Um, I'm thinking of uh, what team. They struggled against someone, and I now I can't think of when it was. I really can't um, come up with too many that they've struggled against. They lost to Maryland 20 to 17 on the last Texas minute field goal. Okay. UTSA. Okay, Probably out of conference. Game. Yeah, out of yeah. a conference. Um, you know, Wisconsin beat them 24 nothing. You know, so obviously the offense under 100 yards of total offense was not helping the defense right. whatsoever. So that's difficult to hold up for an entire game, only give up 24 points there. The Rutgers game was like 21-14, 20-14, something in that range. The Minnesota win, the Penn State win, the three games that they've won in the Big Ten – Nebraska, Minnesota, Penn State is pretty impressive. It is. It's very impressive, and it's. I give credit to Brett. That's why I have no doubt that Brett can, even if he's coaching from home because he's out be- due to COVID, he can win this game. I don't. I mean, he's won at Minnesota. Um, he won at Penn State. So the road ish, the road thing. He's got this team primed and ready. Illinois' defense is going to match up just fine against Iowa's offensive line, and then who's the I'm drawing a blank. It's 10 o'clock and I've been talking for four hours. Who's the running back? Running back. Who's so good. Brown. Chase Brown. He knocks off a big play. It seems like every week. Um, and again, I give so much credit to Brett Bielema. Um, I respect the heck out of that guy. I used to just despise Brett when he was at Wisconsin. Um, and now I respect the heck out of him because, you know, you, you gave me the, you set me straight during the off season, Mark, about how he did not fail at Arkansas. Um, and that was sort of my ignorant viewpoint of just looking at record without really weighing division and, and uh, you know, just what it takes to be a head football coach at that level in the SEC and going up against the likes of Alabama and LSU year, year in and year out. Um, he has been, he has been, I think, terrific year one for Illinois. Um, they've had their ups and downs. Heck, I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> that was not a that that's not a program that's really had any success success since 2007, and uh, he he's proven he can beat almost anybody on any given day. I mean, you win at Penn State. What else do you want? I know, and considering when you look at the contenders being those top four teams in the Big Ten West, he has yet to play Iowa, of course. Uh, the, the Wisconsin game didn't necessarily go crazy, get out of hand, but they were dominated. They beat Minnesota. They Purdue needed a touchdown in the last minute of the game to win at home against Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. This is, that's why, you know, heading into this game, um, these last two games, um, these aren't typical. This isn't a typical Iowa, Illinois game. I remember, was it 2000? 18 where Iowa won 63 zero over in Champaign. <laughs> I remember that score. Yeah. Not going to happen this week, folks. Not going to happen. And I, I expect it to be another close game. It should be fun. It should be a great game. One viewer had a last second field goal by Iowa being the difference 19 to 16, but we had three or four other scores that were three score games, 21 point type games. Yeah. I don't I, think I so be, either. I would be very surprised if that happened.